thank you, Jan. It's um, lovely to be here today. And um, especially, um, I feel it a great privilege and honour to have been asked to present the lecture today um, in memory of Don Grant. I knew Don Grant for many years and had the um, opportunity to work on committees with him over a number of years. And um, I have a great deal of admiration and respect for him. He really was a walking encyclopedia. Today, the topic that I'm talking about is Family Search, and I've entitled my talk Family Search, A World of Family History Possibilities. And my topic fits in so beautifully with our multicultural theme today. And I hope as I move through what I want to share with you today, that you will um, be able to get a, an understanding of just the vast nature and how diverse the records available on the Family Search are. So, first of all, um, an explanation of what Family Search is. Family Search International is a not for profit organisation. It's a sponsored and funded by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Now, um, it, uh, its predecessor, the Genealogical Society of Utah or GSU, was formed in 1894. So, for 120 years now, Family Search has been um, collecting and preserving and sharing family history records. And to give you a bit of an understanding of the breadth of the collection, I want to just give you a little bit of background history. I won't take too long with this, um, but unless I do that, you just won't have a full appreciation of the sorts of records that are available. Um, I mentioned that uh, Family Search began in 1894, and so uh, they began to collect records. In 1938, Family Search pioneered the use of microfilm as a records preservation tool. And over the years, they've amassed an enormous collection, which is in the billions of images of historic records. So initially, microfilming was undertaken in um, North America, uh, Britain, Scandinavia, um, and Europe, where the majority of the church members at the time could trace their ancestry. Now, in 1952, they began to microfilm in South America. And here in the South Pacific, they began um, microfilming records uh, in 1959, and it's very interesting that the very first camera operator that was employed was a man by the name of Ronald Pollard, and I had the opportunity to talk, I know Ron quite well, and I had the opportunity to talk to him recently. And um, at the time, he started to do the assisted shipping records um, into Victoria. These are records that are now held at the Public Records Office. But at the time, they were held at the State Library. Um, it was known as the Public Library then. And so the first task he undertook was to uh, film these records. And uh, he said that he was given a small room off the um, main reading room. It was just next to Harry Nunn, the state archivist's room. And uh, he said before he could begin to film them, the records, uh, they'd been folded, tied with red tape. They were very dusty and dirty. Um, he hired five university students to wash the records before they could actually begin to film them. And uh, during that time, he spent uh, a number of years travelling around Australia filming records. And... Uh, many opportunities arose for him to access other records. Um, he mentioned that he became aware of some funeral director's records. Uh, an early Melbourne funeral director, uh, J.D. Lewis, which was uh, had a branch in Carlton, he was able to access uh, the books and he'd filmed them. And he, uh, he said that uh, in going through his image, images, he realised that he had some that needed to be redone. They were a little bit blurred. So he returned to the funeral directors to collect these uh, records, the registers, and he was told, oh, you've just arrived in time. They're downstairs in the laundry by the furnace. They're about to be destroyed. And so he, of course, reclaimed them, brought them back, uh, refilmed the faulty images, and they were then donated to the State Library. So lots of interesting stories along the way about um, accessing records and making them available. Now, 
during uh, the 1970s, there was a departure from the previous um, policy where microfilming projects began to move into areas where records were most at risk. So filming began in Asia, Africa and the Middle East. And earlier Diane was talking about records in um, Egypt and she happened to mention to me that the Armenian records in Egypt have been microfilmed by Family Search. Um, Filming continued through um, Korea, the Philippines, Taiwan, Japan, Indonesia, Sri Lanka. You can see this, this was the um, beginning date of many different um, filming projects. Now, um, in 1983, a major breakthrough occurred when permission was granted for Family Search to go into the archives and to begin to film records there. This was the first time that foreigners had even been permitted to set foot into these facilities. In 1991, after 22 years of unsuccessful negotiations, um, Family Search was able to um, begin to commence filming in areas uh, behind the Iron Curtain, because this, at this time there was the fall of the communist regime. And so they began to film records in Slovakia, Estonia, Bulgaria, Russia and other former Soviet states. Prior to this time, um, they had been in behind the Iron Curtain. They had filmed records in Hungary and Poland. So back in 1975, there was about 80 different film um, crews operating. By 1990, uh, this number had grown to 200. And in the year 2000, there were more than 300 camera crews operating worldwide with projects in more than 100, 100 countries throughout the world. Now today, um, we're not using microfilming technology anymore. Um, we've switched over to digital capture. And so um, when we are accessing records, we um, do it on digital cameras. Now the purpose of this um, vast... A uh, microfilming project and now digital um, capture project is twofold. Firstly, to collect the information that um, will assist family history researchers in doing their research. And secondly, to preserve this information for future generations. And there were two key selling points to the, um, this particular project. Firstly, the filming um, is done at no cost to the institution that holds the records. And for many, this provides the only means for these um, records to be preserved. And secondly, a free uh, print film copy is given to um, the institution so that the original records are preserved and instead of using the original records, people wanting to access them can then use a microfilm copy. Now, an example that shows the significance of this particular um, project um, occurred in uh, the Cook Islands in May 1992 when an arsonist set fire to one of their government buildings which housed their civil registration records and most of these records were destroyed. As these um, records had previously been filmed, within weeks of the fire, 51 replacement films were made and dispatched to Rarotonga with no cost to the government. And I can list a number of other instances where records um, have been destroyed, but they were previously microfilmed, so um, replacement copies have been able to be provided, and a copy of those original records has been preserved as a consequence. Now, it's wonderful to have this amazing collection, but how, how do you access it? Well, with this um, growing collection, it was found necessary to build a facility that would house it. So in 1966, the Granite Mountain Records Vault was opened, and this was a specially purpose-built facility that's located in the mountains about um, 20 miles out of Salt Lake. It's uh, in the foothills of the Wasatch Mountain. And it's um, a series of six vaults that are built deep in the mountainside. They're about um, six or 700 feet um, under solid granite. And they have huge steel um, 
it's nice to see what the facility looks like. Um, they have huge steel bank vault doors weighing between from 9 to 14 tonnes each that protect the entrances. And um, the conditions are perfect for uh, storage. Now, it's always been my ambition to go on a tour of the vault. And uh, I did think at one stage that maybe with some connections I might get to visit. But for security reasons, there is no public access to the vaults. But you can take a virtual tour online. So all you need to do is Google and um, you can see a very interesting tour behind the scenes at the Granite Mountain Record Vault. Now, um, this huge collection of records, to make them accessible to people worldwide, a network of family history centres has been um, built. These, they started rolling them out in 1964 and today there's uh, over 4,700 of these. They're generally located in um, church meeting houses and they're all staffed by volunteers. I've been a volunteer at the Cathy's Lane One Turner one for about 25 years now. Uh, also, many libraries and family history societies have a film distribution licence, so they're able to access the microfilm records that Family Search holds. Uh, the GSV here in Victoria have um, a film distribution licence, and I noticed when I was looking online that um, we have a number of others. Cobram Family History Group is a um, a film, a licensed film distribution centre. So there's lots of smaller groups too that are not close to another centre and um, that you can order films through them. But that's all available, that information, on the Family Search website. Um, we also have a wonderful library in Salt Lake, the Family History Library, and I've had the opportunity to visit there a number of times to access the records. And many of the microfilms um, are just on the shelf. You can help yourself to them. The thing that I found when I was there last most beneficial, they were doing, um, you could book free of charge a consultation with one of their professional genealogists. And I was interested in some of my London ancestors that have, um, I'd hit brick walls with. and just spent about three quarters of an hour with just getting the most amazing advice. Now, um, one of the most significant advancements for family search in recent years is um, occurred in 2005. They've actually developed high-speed scanners where they're able to convert microfilm into digital format so that they can be viewed on a, a, a computer. Now, these scanners are converting 2.5 million rolls of microfilm from the Granite Mountain Records Vault into tens of millions of ready-to-index digital images. And the scanners are a bit like a camera. As the microfilm uh, form um, unwinds, the images on the microfilm are converted into a long ribbon of high-quality digital images. And a computer program quality checks the ribbon and uses special algorithms to break it up into individual images. And this entire process takes about 20 minutes per roll of film. So another milestone, um, this is an ongoing um, process and because of this huge number of records that are, are stored in the vault, it's going to take a while for this um, to happen. Now another um, really important milestone occurred this year in June when Family Search announced that it had published its one billionth digital image online. And this particular record came from a quite small archive in Peru. So when you think about a billion images, it's very difficult to imagine just how vast that is. So to give you some idea, some perspective, if you were to look at each one of those images just for one second each, continually, it would take you 32 years to view them. Or if each one was equivalent to an A4 page of information, if you laid them end to end, they would stretch for 304,000 kilometres. Now, this is only a very small this isn't all the records. Um, about 70% of this information has come from um, record co microfilm conversion. Some has come from new um, acquisitions that are coming in in digital format and some uh, a small amount has come from par 
partnerships. Now, when we think about this, literally what it's doing is bringing records from obscure archives into your home, records that you may not even know about. As Diane talked today about her quest to find information about her husband's family and how difficult it was to visit each of these individual archives and to gain access. Um, most of us aren't in a position, we don't have the financial means, we don't have the time, but um, through the resources of Family Search, it's bringing those records into the homes of everyday people. And this particular slide just shows us the makeup of the records, and we can see that um, there's a very large proportion of those records are from um, Italy, Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Brazil, Philippines, Belgium, Spain. So it's a very multicultural mix of records. And this has occurred in the last seven years. And um, the rate at which the information is being uploaded is accelerating. So it's taken seven years to get this first billion records online. It's been estimated that it's going to take only three and a half years to get the next billion records online. And this is only about a quarter of what is held in the Granite Mountain Record Vault. And, um, of course, new records are being um, acquired on a daily basis. So this um, amount of information is growing continually. Now, there's many cult or a number of cultures where they don't have written records uh, recording their family history. In some nations, information is passed from um, down through the generations um, orally. And Family Search has been involved in gathering oral histories. Beginning in Samoa in 1968, Family Search began to collect oral genealogy to preserve ancestral information in countries where there were no written records. So interviews um, have now been recorded in Tahiti, American Samoa, the Cook Islands, Tonga, New Zealand, Taiwan and Indonesia. And um, the concept was quite simple. It was recording... Um, information on tape, and it's the spoken memory of those um, that, are, that are still living. For the last five years, the church has been very busy in sub-Saharan Africa, um, they, where they've employed local young men um, as contractors to gather these oral histories, and they go out with audio recorders and digital cameras, and there's a great urgency to collecting this information because family historians are ageing and they're dying before these histories can be recorded. I've heard it say that when um, a person dies, a library of information is lost. So far, they've recorded 10,000 oral histories, but there's so many more to collect. Now, these are available um, under community trees on the Family Search website. So if you go to the wiki and look for that, I was really interested. Um, I have a son-in-law who's Samoan, and my family have actually just travelled to Samoa, and I'm going in a day or two, and I'm going to record. We're going for a family wedding, but I'm going to record oral histories from his living um, elderly rel uh, relatives. So I'm quite excited excited about the opportunity, but looking on the website, I looked under his family name and saw that there were already a number of recorded oral histories for this family. Now, how do you access the records? Through the website, www.familysearch.org. Now, as Jan mentioned, it was launched in May 1999. And at the time it was launched, it was the largest genealogical database ever to be made available on the internet, and it attracted worldwide attention. On the first day of operation, it attracted over 100 million hits, and that was as many as the next most popular genealogy website was getting in a month at the time. Cindy Howell of Cindy's List stated, it's a real boon to genealogy. It's like bringing Disneyland to your home. So today I'm going to give you a, just a brief overview of the Family um, Search website and what you can find there because many people have used it, they've done some searches, but they don't fully utilise all the resources that are available. Um, in the top right hand corner is a little get help button. This will uh, 
take you into the um, contact and help drop down box. So Family Search provides 24-7 phone, toll-free phone or email support. Now, um, if you phone their number, uh, you're not going to get somebody in a call centre. You're going to get a volunteer like me. So it could be someone from anywhere in the world. Um, or you can email if you have a query that you need help with. In the Learning Centre, there is a huge array of online family history courses that range from beginners to advanced. You can access them under topics, you can access them under um, geographic area. Uh, it shows the most popular courses, it'll show you the new courses. Um, and there's also a lot of um, just short five minute um, videos for those that are beginning that are just teaching one little uh, research technique. It might have um, what is a census, um, how to record your sources. So these are a great um, learning tool for those that are new to family history, but even experienced family historians can gain a lot of information. And the annual Roots Tech conferences, there's a number of wonderful presentations um, from them that are available online. Now, what most people are interested in is actually searching the records and possibly this is what you've done in the past. So using the search button, you can get to um, the search template. Now, you can begin to just to search straight away, just typing in names. And I'm not going to talk about um, the different aspects of, of actually searching, but um, you can actually go to the regions. On the right, there is a map and it identifies particular regions. I've just selected one here to show you the types of records. You can see here in this Asian region, there's records for China, India, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and Sri Lanka. Now I've just typed in a surname, and uh, it comes up with a number of results. So if we click on that particular person, we'll see that there's additional information. Now, very importantly, at the bottom of the record, it cites, gives us um, a citation for the source of this record. Family history without sources is mythology. You really need to record where your information has come from. And for every record that you access on Family Search, on the Family Search website, it gives you a citation that you can copy and paste into the notes of your family history program. Now, if you come back with a huge number of results, you can actually divide uh, or filter your results into the collection it came from. Um, up next to the records tab on the top left hand side, you'll see the collections button. If you click on that, it will then divide all your results up according to the particular collection they've come from. And um, you can then decide which collections you want to look at. Now, I've chosen this one. If I move down to the one of the page. Okay. Um, I've just done a search on a surname. Um, a more unusual surname for my fam from my family tree, Helsham, and I've specified Australia and it's come back with a number of results. I've chosen this particular one, John Philip Helsham, because it's actually come from the indexes to wills and probates from the Public Records Office. And I just wanted to talk about this particular project for a, mi uh, a minute. Liz talked about this today in her presentation. The digitising of uh, just clicking through the record and it tells me that I can view the document on the right hand side it has a digital camera and that will take me to um, a digital image of the entry in the indexes and because these have been digitised we can go to the State Library website and actually look at um, the will. Now the um, Wills and probates that are held at the Public Records Office. In November 2004, Family Search began digitising these particular records from 1844 to 1925. Um, since then, they've done the inquest deposition files and um, they're now back doing uh, the wills and probates from 1925 onwards. Now, the very first camera team um, that was there um, 
I know a little bit about that because I was involved in the initial, um, I guess, negotiations for Family Search to come in and to begin to do this particular project. And the first couple that arrived, the Lombardis, they were a um, retired couple from the United States. This work is all done free of charge to, um, to PROV, and it's actually done by, um, on, on the majority of it's done by volunteers. So in this case, it was a retired couple that came out at their own expense and spent um, initially 18 months. And uh, they just work, they work from 7.30 in the morning till four, five days a week, uh, just digitising these records. There was two camera crew and a number of other volunteers that also assisted with record preparation. I was interested to see recently on, um, a fam on the Family Search website, they were calling for volunteers who would come and do this sort of work. And there was a testimonial from the Lombardies, and they mentioned about they did their first record preservation um, mission in Melbourne and how much they enjoyed it. Um, since then, in 2004, they're now on their fifth um, record preservation assignment. So for a retired couple that are now 10 years older, they're still working five days a week. I think that's a tremendous effort and they obviously love it. We have um, six out at public records office now working. I think there's two cameras that are currently working on the next run. And then here's the actual will. And it's interesting, um, this particular man died during the First World War. His son died at Gallipoli only a week before. And um, he mentions that his sons are only to inherit his estate if they don't marry Catholics or Germans. So it's uh, very typical. If you read any of the, the wills at this time, this is very common um, at the time, mainly the Germans, not the Catholics. Okay. Uh, now, we've had a quick look at the records. When you search, the records have been divided up according to historical records. So these have actually come from a, a, a historical record. And um, you can actually search the genealogies. Now, these have been submitted by people over um, the years. And when you find a result here, you will find um, additional family connections. So this particular one... Um, you can see that you're seeing part of a pedigree. You're seeing his descendants, his spouse, uh, parents, grandparents, and there's an arrow indicating that it goes on further um, generations. Um, now, the catalogue, this is the way you access information um, to see the holdings, the microfilm holdings and um, other records that are available. So because we're talking about different countries today, I've just typed in Bengal, India to give you an idea of the sorts of records and we can see that um, there's um, a number of different sorts of records, directories, history, court records, merchant marine, probate. Um, there's also church records and you can see there's parish register transcripts and there's also Roman Catholic returns for births, deaths and marriages. So you would always look at the film notes. There's actually uh, 526 microfilm reels in this collection. Um, and uh, you'd need to look down and, uh, and move through those to see which particular ones would be of benefit to you. Now, another um, underutilised source on family search is the wiki. The wiki doesn't actually have information, um, biographical information about people, but it um, tells you how to find that information. Um, the very popular research outlines, which were a print volumes available previously, all that information has been absorbed into the wiki. So there's um, nearly 80,000 articles uh, relating to 245 countries. And if you're looking for information, the wiki is a very good place to start. And it does have links to digitised records. Um, here's just another slide on the wiki with background information. Uh, and if you were to type in um, Victoria uh, Research, Here's our very own state library, links to the Public Records Office Victoria, the AIGS, the GSB, um, and links to their website. So if you didn't know how to do research here in Victoria, um, it's giving you a list of the places that you would go to access that information. 
Um, another very interesting page I found um, on the wiki was helpful international websites. And this went through country by country and gave a fabulous collection of websites for each particular country that would help you in your family history research. Now, another um, newer resource on family search is the new family tree. It's usually not such a funny shape. <laughs> um, when you're using the Family Search website and you're searching, you don't need to log on or register. You can just get on and search the records. But if you want to uh, use the Family Tree, you will need to register. The resources, Family Search is totally free to use. Um, in registering, you're just um, giving a username, um, a putting in a password and a contactable email address. And when you do that, you'll begin to form a family tree. There were some concerns about privacy with a family tree. Anyone that is living, their information is masked. Only the person that contributes that information. Now, on this particular slide, I've logged on. This is my um, family tree. I've masked my own information with a smiley face. Um, but anyone else looking at that would not be able to see that information because I'm living and they did not submit that information. But they would be able to see information relating to um, my other family members. Now, you can view the information on Family Tree in a number of different formats. This is a portrait version. So this shows my parents, grandparents, great-grandparents or you can look at it in a conventional family tree format. And unfortunately, with just um, a screenshot like that, it doesn't show you how you can click and drag and move through the generations. When you locate information, you can bring up uh, a person, you can bring up their individual information, their biographical information. Um, it shows them with um, a spouse and children and also as a child with their parents. Now, another new feature with Family Tree is the ability to be able to add um, photos, stories and documents. As a family historian, we can usually gather biographical information, but to be able to access photos of ancestors and family members and also to hear stories about their lives. This is what enriches and brings people to life. So I've been very excited when I heard about this new feature and I've been quite busy uploading um, photos to family search. So this is my third great grandmother and I've uploaded a number of photos. Uh, when you look at her individual record, it'll, it shows um, there's six photos, there's a couple of stories part of the story and the people that are uh, mentioned in, in her, um, that particular story, uh, there's links to them also. They're identified on the family tree. The people that I have um, put photos in for, I can look at them in um, alphabetical order. And this is just some of my photos. It's very simple to upload. You just click the upload button and then go to wherever you have them stored. You'll need to have scanned them on your computer and then you can just upload them and then type a description and link them to the family tree. Uh, this is just an example of a particular photo. I've given it a title and I've also put some detail about it and then identified each of the people in the photo and linked to them uh, to their record on the family tree. You can also use it to search for records. And uh, this is my maiden name, and uh, it's an unusual name, and uh, I typed it in. Now, these particular, the top three on the left-hand side, um, I haven't submitted these. Uh, somebody else has submitted them. I know the names. I know where they fit on the family tree. They're, they're not closely related. But I had never seen photos of these particular people. So it was very exciting for me to find these photos online. Now, family search indexing. Using we all want to be able to access records as easily as possible. And so being able to use an index enables us to find records that we may not even know exist. So FamilySearch 
has um, a capability to index records. And um, I recently started to um, volunteer as a family search indexer. It's quite a simple process. There's about 200,000 plus um, indexes that are registered and uh, it's just a case of um, downloading the program, which takes a minute, and then uh, selecting a particular project that you want to work on. So um, this particular batch that I'm interested in doing at the moment are actually um, Australian records. They're burial and cremation orders from Tasmania. As you can see, the, a digital copy of the original record shows at the top of the screen, and then underneath there are the fields that I key. And each key, um, each field has a little description on the right that shows me, um, gives me information about what it is um, I'm typing. Now, it takes me, these batches have 15 um, entries in them and it takes me about 15 minutes to complete a batch. So it's quite a simple thing. You don't have to be online to, to do the work. You just need to download a batch and then to upload it. Now, earlier on this year, in the, over the weekend of July the 20th and 21st, there was a special invitation for family search indexes to, um, to all get online and... Um, index a batch over that particular um, weekend. And what they were trying to do was to beat a previous uh, record of having more than 50,000 indexes all online on the same day or two to index a batch. And they actually achieved well beyond that. They achieved 66,511. So it was very exciting when a day or two later when um, I got some feedback, uh, thank you for participating and um, for being involved. Now, family search indexing is only a um, partial answer to providing online indexed records. In February this year, Family Search announced a series of agreements with Ancestry.com, Find My Past and My Heritage to accelerate the delivery of freely searchable genealogical records to family history researchers. These agreements are in line with the Family Search mission to publish online as many freely available searchable genealogical records as possible. Working together, Family Search and its partners will bring billions of currently unsearchable and unavailable records to patrons decades before these records would otherwise become available. Now, just two other um, exciting... I've lost two slides. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to have to describe them. Um, Family Search recently announced that there were two new mobile um, apps that can be do downloaded. They're free of charge. One is Family Search Tree, and the other is Family Search Memories. And you can put these on your iPad or your iPhone, and they actually connect to um, the Family Tree. So if you've submitted information to Family Tree, you can view your Family Tree online complete with your photos so I can now carry around with me on my mobile phone my family history information so when I travel to an archive or a repository I can just pull out my mobile phone and look up the information with family search memories I can view all the photos I've uploaded I can share them with relatives I can actually um, if I was visiting um, an elderly relative and I wanted to record an oral interview I can and upload it directly. So it's a wonderful resource and um, research tool. In conclusion, um, many of you will have used Family Search in the past, and you may not have found um, exactly what you're looking for. Because of the um, vastness of the collection and the rate at, w at which it grows. If you looked yesterday, you may not have found what you're looking for. But every day, Family Search adds 1.6 million searchable records. So if you didn't find what you were looking for yesterday, check again today. There's a whole world of family history possibilities available to you on Family Search. Thank you.